deepening relationships in order to document and promote our African languages. Hi, everybody. I'm Scott Smith. My wife and I serve with three organizations in Spain and in Equatorial Guinea, Africa. With SIL International, I'm a consultant in sociolinguistics and translation. With the Spanish promoter of linguistics, I am a professor in a master's program with the University of Leon. And with the Equatorial Guinea Council of Scientific and Technological Research, I am an honorary researcher. <clears throat> the theme of this conference, uh, seventh annual conference, is recognizing relationships in language documentation and conservation. And this paper will show how deepening long-term relationship and partnership have benefited the language communities of Equatorial Guinea in developing their languages. We're gonna take kind of a lightning trip to Equatorial Guinea today. There's a lot of fascinating things about this country for linguistic and sociolinguistic work. As you can see, it spans the equator. Uh, there's islands on both sides of the equator. <clears throat> and we have a continental part of the country with eight Bantu languages. We have islands with uh, a, an English-based Creole, a Portuguese-based Creole, and a couple of Bantu languages. Interestingly, Equatorial Guinea is also uh, the only country in the world that shares both Spanish and French as official languages. It's the only country in the world that shares both Spanish and Portuguese as official languages. And it's the only country in the world that shares both French and Portuguese as official languages. So whether you're talking European languages or African languages, it's a very fun and interesting country in which to work. <clears throat> and talk a little bit about the 26 years of history in building relationships in language work in Equatorial Guinea. Starting in 1995, uh, SIL International and the Spanish promoter of linguistics began sending Spanish university students every summer to do sociolinguistic survey in the languages of Equatorial Guinea. Uh, I'm gonna abbreviate EG through the rest of this to represent Equatorial Guinea. The goal of our trips was to update the ethnologue database for the living languages spoken in Equatorial Guinea. In 1998, the governmental office Council of Scientific and Technological Research, which we'll call FICTE, sponsored SIL's fourth summer research trip, and they are still partnering with SIL today. It's been a very, very positive partnership for, for all of us involved. In 1999, I think they invited SIL to send a long-term team to work with the Equatorial Ghanaian language communities in language development. And in 2001, SIGDE and SIL sponsored the first National Linguistic Symposium of Equatorial Guinea, inviting key leaders from 10 indigenous languages in Equatorial Guinea. The delegates unanimously recommended to the government an action plan for language development. The next year, SIL sent a team into Equatorial Guinea, uh, still there, uh, working with language communities eliciting word lists, developing alphabets, a lot of training uh, in linguistics and literacy. Uh, so of the alphabets that were developed, some were heritage alphabets that had been around for decades, in one case for a century, and others were based on phonological analysis and orthography proposals made to the community. So we're gonna look real quick at just a couple of these languages, you know, just to see the languages that we have in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, the Bagiele language is predominantly in Cameroon. It's a pygmy language, but uh, there are some camps in Equatorial Guinea, and uh, it's an A80 language closely related to the Kwasio language of Equatorial Guinea. <coughs> Sorry, the it's in both Equatorial Guinea and Cameroon. We have the Basek language, which is a Bantu A40 Basa language. We have the Bubi language, which is uh, A30 Bubi Banga group. And this is the Fadambu, the speech of Anobon, of the island of Anobon. This is the Portuguese-based Creole that we have in Equatorial Guinea. We have the Fan language is more than 80% of the population. It's the dominant language from Bantu A70, Ewondo Fang. 
And uh, this is Quasio. Uh, it is an A80 Maka Gem language. And the dialect used in Equatorial Guinea is Bisio. The other dialects are in Cameroon. And we have four more languages from the Bubi Benga, uh, Benga uh, A30 group. That is uh, Bapuku in Equatorial Guinea and Cameroon, Benga in Equatorial Guinea and Gabon, uh, Iyasa in predominantly Cameroon and in Equatorial Guinea, and uh, Kombe, which is exclusively in Equatorial Guinea. And then we have another Creole. This is our English-based Atlantic Creole. Um, very interesting language. And these languages, uh, these uh, West African Atlantic-based pigeons or English-based Atlantic pigeons are being used so much now growing as languages of identity in the urban contexts that the BBC a few years ago began daily broadcasting into the pigeon languages, the uh, West African pigeon languages. So you can imagine the years that it took to develop those uh, alphabets. You've seen those 11 alphabets, but in 2018, after 20 plus years of building relationships, six of these language communities began working together with SIL and Thikde in a community-based language development workshop series called Our Language and Identity Journey. In this series, we've had 32 participants from the six language, languages. These are linguists, uh, translators, uh, political leaders from that community, say traditional leaders from those communities. And it's been a great group to work together with. Uh, we worked in uh, seven different working tables, even though it was six languages. Uh, the Fang language had two tables because uh, it's the largest language in the country. And we had two organizations involved that were sponsoring the Fang tables. So each table, <coughs> uh, was sponsored by an agency. This is by the governmental agency, Council of Scientific and Technological Research, our first Fong table. Uh, we also had mostly cultural associations, civil and cultural associations, but each, each table was sponsored by an agency. They chose their moderator they, uh, to lead the group in the activities, and then they chose somebody to be a secretary and present their results back to the general assembly group. And uh, this is the second Fong working table. It was sponsored by the Christian Association of Bible Translation. They have completed uh, publishing the New Testament in Fong, and they're working in some other languages. The Kombe working group is part of a cultural association of a federation of uh, coastal language groups, a cultural association called Tatangangwe. And the Kwasio Working Group had their cultural association sponsoring their table. It's called Nla Kwasio. Uh, the Benga Working Group is also part of that cult coastal cultural association, Tatangangwe. Um, most of them are come, live on an island. The Basek Working Group had their cultural association called Casa Cultural Basek. And uh, the last group were the Balenge. Uh, it's, also, it's a very endangered language, smaller group, but also part of the Tatangangwe Cultural Association. So in our language and identity journey, uh, the first phase of the training of the, of the series is learning. It's called communal. It's our communal awareness phase, and it's learning about the sustainable use model of language development. Uh, we talk about language vitality. The first scale of language vitality was developed by Joshua Fishman, uh, who developed the graduated intergenerational disruption scale with eight levels of language vitality. This was expanded in 2010. Uh, Paul Lewis and Gary Simons expanded the GIDs to expanded GIDs, EGIDs, with 13 levels of language vitality. And uh, there was the need to include uh, dormant languages and extinct languages, but also in, in Fishman's original eight levels, there were a couple of levels of endangerment. We wanted, the SIL wanted this scale to reflect uh, all of the UNESCO levels of language endangerment. So some more levels were added there, as well as uh, the international languages that have been declared international languages by the United Nations, um, six languages. So it, there's a scale of 13 levels of language vitality in the EGIDs. And uh, 
we talk, we emphasize four sustainable levels, the, the levels that are very stable and, and do, don't tend to shift quite as easily. But if we can focus on sustainable literacy, um, sustainable orality, sustainable identity, and sustainable history. We also talk about the five conditions that affect any of these levels of language vitality. So of the 13 levels of language vitality, you can in each one of them, you can talk about the functions of language use, the domains where they're using the language, about community acquisition of the language, uh, how, how the language is attained. You can talk about the motivation of the community and attitudes toward the language. Um, environmental factors that can be political factors or social attitudinal factors as well that, that affect uh, in, in terms of the environment of the language. And then the last condition is differentiation of functions, whether there is any level of diglossia because certain functions hopefully are reserved for that language and won't easily be encroached upon by larger majority languages. So, we do a lot of activities. <clears throat> We've chosen to just pick, select one from each work from, I mean, one for each activity instead of showing you all the different seven working groups. But one of the activities is to map, um, we talk about the ecology of our language and we map our entire language community with uh, not only all of the trying to cover the area where all the speakers of our language live. This is the BCO language, the large yellow tags there the BCO language with all the uh, villages that are understood to be BCO villages, some of them are multicultural, multilingual villages. So in addition to the yellow BCO villages, the villages that are marked in black, but within the, the, the whole map shows these BCO villages, you see some uh, purple tags. Those are villages that also have a strong Fung presence. And you have pink tags that show the Ndowe presence, then Doe languages are coastal languages from north to south that are related chain of languages. And then uh, the, in the middle there, the Balenge, the greenish uh, yellow tag, the Balenge is another language that is a uh, neighbor language with the BCO. So help the, the participants to understand the ecology of the language with, it's very important to not just talk about their language, but all the languages, the entire repertoire of languages that are used within the community. We do an activity for understanding the domains of use of our language and, and of all the languages. So um, each of, after we talked about the linguistic community, which is all the speakers, we talk about a speech community <clears throat> being one village or one neighborhood where that is predominantly perceived of as that language community. And they choose a speech community that they know well, and then they describe with this representative map here, the different domains of use, language use in that community. So this is the Basek language community, a speech, pardon me, speech community called Ngonamanga, the village of Ngonamanga. And you can see um, they've drawn out here sports in the top left, there's a, a soccer field. So sports would be one domain, church, school, businesses, residences, the village well is here as a social gathering place, the uh, health, health uh, clinic, and then the agricultural zones where they do farming, the, the uh, jungle where they do the, the hunting areas where they do hunting, and then on the coast, the uh, fishing. So these are main domains of language use in the community, and they've marked with the colored tags so that uh, the purple, I'm sorry, the yellow, the, uh, the pink ones, this is a Basek community. You see that the Basek, the pink is everywhere except for the schoolhouse. So they use Basek in every domain in the village except education. So in the, the schoolhouse is that on the, on the far right there that has only purple. The purple represents uh, Spanish. You can see that Spanish is also used in all those domains except interestingly, not used in fishing, top, top of the picture, there's no purple there, not used in hunting, bottom left, and not used in agriculture. So in those domains of fishing, hunting, and agriculture, they only use two local indigenous African languages. And then the uh, yellow green tags are the One language, it's a neighboring community. And uh, 
you can see that the only is used in all the domains except uh, their school is only Spanish. The church in this village, being a Basek village, only uses Spanish and Basek. In the neighboring villages, which are One villages, they do have churches that are going to use Spanish and One. But this activity helps the participants to determine the domains that are used in their lang in their language and then which languages they use for those domains because they're not they're, they're multilingual communities they're not limited to using one uh, speech form or one language for any any of those domains except in this case Spanish is the only language domain used in education so a lot of fun these activities the the uh, act, one of our activity identities is to make a timeline of critical important events in the history of our people. Now this is a very interesting and fun event for a lot of the participants, particularly if they come from a non-written, from an oral society without a written history. This may be the first time that anybody has tried to write down a, a written history chronologically of their people. And so it's it, 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 people get excited and very involved in, in debating and talking and sharing a lot of interesting facts. And then if they do this activity on post-it notes, it's helpful because they can easily rearrange them as they add more events to, to get them in chronological order. Um, another identity activity that's a lot of fun, um, make a list of the things about our people that distinguish us and make us feel unique. So here, they this is the No Way Kombe group, a working table, and they've listed several dances. Number one, the dances that are unique to their people group, Number two, activities that are unique to their people group it might be canoe races or it might be lot fit, you know, fishing, whatever different things they do, or maybe the ways that they fish, the kinds of nets they use. Uh, gastronomy, you can see here maybe 20 some dishes that are listed in their language of uh, food that is unique to their people group. Then uh, artwork and uh, handicrafts in number four, several things that identify their people through their artwork. And sometimes it's decorative artwork, but many times it is uh, practical utilitarian things. Like we make crab traps different than anybody else. We make fishing nets different than anyone else. Our canoes are different than anyone else's or whatever. So it's, it's uh, this is artwork and handicrafts and things they create that define their people. Um, rites and rituals in number five several rights listed there. Um, the uh, jobs or professions that are typical among their ethnic community, the languages that they speak. Now here, the Combe, One, Mari, Bueco, Yasa are, are dialects or languages in a continuous chain of languages up and down the coast that are mutually intelligible, at least those five are. So those are five languages that they would all understand and speak. Uh, habitat. They, they are a, traditionally a, a fishing people that love to live and tend to live along the coast. And then uh, the number nine there is games. There's a list of all the different games that would be played by their kids that are unique to their group. So that's another fun activity that um, generates a lot of discussion and it's a lot of interesting uh, fun stuff for people to work through. So the four phases of SIL's language and identity journey uh, phase, these might be six months or a year apart. It's going to depend uh, on the community how fast they want to work. But the first phase, in a weekend, we bring in, uh, want to bring in leaders that have an impact, uh, traditional leaders and linguists and, and uh, authors, people who care about the language, uh, singers and poets. So the first phase is communal awareness, learning about the sustainable use model, uh, language vitality. The second phase is communal evaluation of the language's functions and vitality and stability and sustainability of their own language. And the third phase is planning how they want their language to be used. And then the fourth phase would be implementation and review, what they did and how it went. And um, in our workshop, we completed the first phase and began the second phase. We have done it in 2018-19. We weren't able to work this last year in it because of COVID, but it is evident that the 20 years of working together, building camaraderie and lasting relationships is in the African context, a critical element of successful language documentation and preservation. 
So I would add that uh, if you're wanting to know more about the language and identity journey, you could also check out uh, in this in this uh, conference. There's another workshop by Dave Eberhard and Dan Duke about the language and identity journey. So thank you for allowing me to share with you.